I, okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Anthony Hua. Uh, I am delighted to welcome you to today's Economic Outlook Virtual Seminar. As we embark on our journey to explore the intricate web of economic factors shaping our world in 2023 and beyond, the title of our seminar, De-Risking in a Risky World, could not be more apt for the challenges and uncertainties that lie ahead. In a world where change is the only constant, economic landscape shifts like the tides, and unforeseen events can reshape entire industries overnight, understanding the trajectory of our economy has never been more crucial. I am confident that the discussions that unfold today will provide us with valuable perspective, innovative ideas, and data-driven insights to help us navigate the uncertain waters of the economy. Our distinguished speaker and old friend, Dr. Jerry Nicholsberg, is, to, is prepared to share his knowledge, research, and expertise to shed the light on these critical issues. Dr. Nicholsberg is the Director and Senior Economist from UCLA Anderson Forecast, who has been recognized for his contributions to economic modeling and forecasting of national, California, and regional economies. Also, this is the sixth year Kathy Bank has collaborated with UCLA Anderson Forecast. Our U.S. China Economic Outlook Report September update will be published on our website at kathybank.com under Insights by Kathy after the seminar. Without further ado, I will turn over the call to Dr. Nicholsberg. Let's begin our exploration. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, that was a nice introduction to what we're going to talk about today, and it's always a pleasure to be here with our friends at Cathay Bank. Great, thank you. So uh, what we want to talk about today is the U.S. and China economies, and uh, as uh, Anthony just pointed out, the latest U.S.-China economic report authored by uh, my colleague William Yu and myself uh, will be available from Cathay Bank uh, in the next couple of days. So let's see where we're going to go today. This is our roadmap. We're going to start with a macro outlook for the U.S. And then we're going to turn to interest sensitive sectors. And the rationale for that is that the primary policy uh, of the United States government over the past two years has been from the Federal Reserve raising interest rates, trying to affect these interest rates uh, sensitive sectors. And we want to look at those and see what the impact has been and what that means for the future. And then we're going to cha change uh, and go across the Pacific to China and China's economic stress, which I'm sure all of you have read about. I want to present some data on that and some analysis that we have, and that'll bring us to our conclusions. So let's start with the macro outlook. Uh, and what you see in this picture is real GDP. This is the level of real GDP, and the blue blocks there are the actuals, and the reds are our forecast. Now, we have another forecast coming out on the 4th of, uh, of October, uh, so we'll be revising this, and it'll be a bit stronger in 2023, the reds. Uh, 2024 will remain weak, as you see here, and then again, returning to trend growth. Uh, but you see this dashed line, and the dashed line is a 2.4% growth rate that we experienced in 2018 and 2019. And it looks like we are way under trend growth, that there's a lot of slack in the economy. Uh, but there, in fact, is not. I mean, the unemployment rate is at record lows. And so what has happened in looking behind the numbers is that we've had a decrease in labor force participation rates. If you look at the left-hand graph, you see this is a uh, labor force participation rate of everyone over age 16, and you can see a decline, and then it kind of flattens out. Uh, we get to the, that uh, point that it's a small gray shaded area, and that's the pandemic shutdown. And of course, labor force participation dropped dramatically. And it's come back, but not to the point that it was in 2019. Now, the labor force participation on the part of prime working age adults, age 25 
to uh, 55 is actually higher than it was in 2019. But younger than 25 is lower. And that may be because kids are staying in school longer in this more challenging world that they're going to be entering. Uh, we don't know exactly, but the big drop is represented on the right-hand side. And the right-hand side are the boomers. Uh, and so you see that the boomer labor force participation rate going left to right was increasing. Uh, on the far left is the Great Recession, 2008-2009. We have as part of our retirement savings the equity in our homes. And those boomers in 2008, 2009, 2010, who were planning on retiring and using equity in their homes, found that they had little to negative equity in their homes. So they stayed in the labor force. This is increasing because people age into the 65 and over age category. Uh, but you get to 2020, we have the lockdown, lots of layoffs, lots of equity in homes, and those boomers are 10 years older and they retired by the millions and they're not coming back. And you can see that as you move to the right of that, that gray line. So potential GDP has actually declined and we are in fact uh, growing uh, right around or maybe slightly above trend. And uh, that's what the Fed is worried about. So let's take a look at uh, and what the Fed's been considering over the last 18 months. Uh, they're looking at inflation uh, with 3.2% as uh, the uh, latest inflation. And we just had a new CPI come out uh, since these slides were, were made up. It went up a little bit, but not very much. Uh, but what is important here is looking at the history and looking at data. Uh, so here, what you see is the 1970s. In the 1970s and into the early 1980s, we had high and sustained inflation. It took the 1981-82 recession, which was a very deep uh, and painful recession. It took interest rates that went up to 20% uh, to bring that inflation rate down. And the Fed doesn't want to get into that position anymore. But if you keep moving your eyes further to the left, you see where these two arrows are. And that's uh, 1947 and 1953, the end of World War II and the end of the Korean War. What happened there was that the GIs came home, households had lots of money to spend and they wanted to spend it. And they went out uh, to purchase goods and purchase services and enjoy life for a change. And the economy was oriented around producing more material. So it took a while for the economy to adjust and produce the things that consumers wanted. That's like a supply chain interruption. Come back over to the right. That pattern looks very similar. We ended the uh, pandemic shutdown with household balance sheets being in very good shape. We had very large transfers of income to households, unlike other recessions. Uh, and we came out of that wanting to spend. And so consumers have been spending, but the economy was not ready for uh, the to produce the goods and services that consumers wanted. So there's a lot of similarity there. Uh, and the question is, how much is the red circle and how much are the two black arrows on the left? The real answer is no one knows. And the Fed is concerned that there's a lot in the red circle. The Fed is willing to err on the side of being conservative and trying to squeeze that inflation out even if it's much more like the black lines. So let's just take a look at uh, first what's happened in the three months. This doesn't include the August numbers. The three months uh, ending in July, uh, the CPI inflation rate was 1.6%. So it's been coming down, uh, but not enough to satisfy the, uh, the Fed. So when we look at, uh, so again, this is July, when we look at the year over year, that is prices in July 2023 to prices in, uh, in July 2022, uh, and look at the CPI uh, and then decompose it to say, well, what is driving that 4.7% rate in core inflation? Core inflation takes out energy and food. And, uh, and so each of the items there uh, go from left to right. The 
uh, blue is uh, the orange is the addition of that item to the me measured inflation, and the blue plus the orange is the cumulative. Now, if you look over on the left-hand side, you see, uh, let's say, water, sewage, and trash. Uh, water, sewage, and trash prices have been going up, but it's a small part of average household budget, so it's given a small weight. All of these are weighted, and the one all the way over on the left-hand side, shelter, which is rents, is given a weight of one-third. These are rents, and they are imputed to people who have mortgages that did not have an increase in prices. So shelter is given a very heavy weight. And then the next one is other transportation. And other transportation is principally in automobile repair and in the insurance to cover that repair. And the reason why that's been going up is that we are increasingly buying cars that are electric cars or uh, if they're internal combustion engine cars, they're much more sophisticated with driver assist and repairs have become much more expensive. Just as an example, the repair of a windshield used to be $350. And today, because of all of the sensors and the need for specialized technicians, it's $2,700. That's what's driving that. That is not really a function of anything but a change in our preferences any more than a iPhone 15, I guess, was just released, uh, is the same as a flip phone in days of yore. So we have higher inflation here, but not things that raising interest rates are going to affect. What the Fed is trying to do with raising interest rates is create slack in the economy to slow down those interest sensitive sectors uh, so that they're not putting pressure on the economy so households have less income, and so they're spending less, and that ease of pressure will ease overall inflation. At least that's what they're trying to do. Uh, let's just talk for a minute before we look at those interest-sensitive sectors about yield curve inversions, because there's a popular narrative that yield curve inversions mean a recession is coming. Uh, that's not true. So the yield curve inversion is when long rates, such as the 10-year Treasury, uh, are lower than short rates, such as the two-year treasury. And this is the this graph is the difference between those two. Uh, and all it means is that financial investors, people who are in the market buying and selling treasury bills, think that interest rates in the future are going to be lower than interest rates today. That might mean that interest rates in the future are going to be lower because there's a recession, uh, but it might mean that they're going to be lower for other reasons, and there are many other reasons. And if you look at this graph, I think the two things that you should notice, one is uh, there's a real irregular pattern to these yield curve inversions. So it's hard to say that the pattern today on the right hand side is similar to another pattern or a repetitive pattern that you would see in the graph. Uh, the second is there aren't many yield curve inversions. So we have a very small sample and hard to do inference. So it is uh, true that you see yield curve inversions near recessions. Those are the shaded gray areas. But that it causes recessions, there's really no evidence for that. Okay, so uh, what is uh, mitigating against the Fed uh, actually slowing the economy and, and driving us into a mild recession? One is consumption remains very strong in the latest retail sales, and that's for August, uh, we're up significantly. This is overall consumption. And uh, if we just draw a trend line there, we're above trend and we're staying above trend. Consumers, households want to spend, they want to be out buying services, but still buying goods. And, uh, and so we see that also in, uh, in imports. Imports are a little weaker relative to when we were all locked down and uh, and just buying goods because we couldn't do anything besides that. But we're still buying a lot of goods. So consumption remains strong. Also, no surprise, it is a more dangerous world. And the U.S. government is increasing its defense spending and is going to increase it even more once we get past this current roadblock. Uh, our allies in Europe and Asia are buying more defense goods. 
And so that's another element of demand. So we have consumption that's uh, two thirds of demand for GDP. We have defense purchases and government purchases uh, that are uh, another 10 percent. So we have a lot of headwinds for the Fed to work against. One thing that I think is important to note with defense purchases is that they're not spread around evenly, like, uh, for example, the infrastructure package. Uh, here are the states that receive most of the defense expenditures, some because they have large bases uh, like uh, Virginia and Maryland and Florida, others that have large bases but are producers of defense durable goods uh, like Texas and California. Uh, and uh, and Connecticut, uh, but it's not spread around evenly. So some states are going to be much more the beneficiaries of this increase in defense spending than others, California in particular, and Southern California in particular. Uh, and so let's look at GDP by state as well to see how this is uh, spread around. So this is 2019 first quarter to 2023 first quarter. These are states with more than five and a half million populations. So these are our large states, uh, the ones that really move the GDP numbers. And uh, these are represented in this graph are all of the states uh, that were growing faster than the U.S. over this period of time. The reason to look at this is to get some sense as to how things are changing around the United States. And you see California uh, is growing faster than the U.S., uh, but not surprisingly, Florida and Texas uh, are also growing faster than the U.S., but also growing faster than California. Now, there's two ways you can get an increase in GDP. One is you can have more people doing more stuff. This is why China, which has 1.4 billion people, has the second largest economy in the world, but is still a relatively poor country. Uh, the other way you can get it is by increasing wealth, increasing productivity. And so if we adjust for all the migration that took place uh, during the pandemic and shortly thereafter, uh, and just look at how GDP per capita has changed, we get a really different picture. Uh, Texas has fallen off the map here, uh, but California has become uh, the top growth state. And what's happening there is technology is, is uh, driving the U.S. economy. Technological innovation, uh, as uh, Anthony said in his introduction, what we have in the modern economy are forces that will pretty rapidly change industries and create lots of economic growth, but in an uneven way. And you really see that in this picture. Okay, so let's go to interest sensitive sectors. You see Chairman Powell there in front of the Federal Reserve in the right hand graph is uh, a representation of the increase in the federal funds rates. These are the things that the Fed wants to affect. Now we know that consumption is going strong, government expenditure is going strong, that's gonna mitigate against that. Let's look at some of the others. Right hand side is new residential construction and uh, there are three lines here, permits, starts, and completions. The historical average is 1.53 million homes per year. That's what the permits for last month came out at, 1.53. You do see a bulge there, and that bulge is in 2020 and 2021 when builders were trying to keep up with that migration. But we're now building at a rate that's higher than what we saw in 2018 and 2019. And it's certainly not declining. So increases in interest rates are not affecting residential construction as they historically have. And there are two reasons for that. One is we haven't overbuilt housing. And typically in a recession, we find that, that residential construction implodes because we overbuilt housing. That's not the case now. We've underbuilt housing. And uh, second, low interest rates and refinancing has resulted in people staying in their homes rather than giving up a two and a half percent mortgage for a seven or seven and a half percent mortgage. And so there's not much inventory of existing homes for sale. That means that those who have the income to buy homes at the new interest rates 
are forced into buying homes uh, that are newly built. Builders are looking at this, that they can sell their homes at a good price, and so they're building. So increases in interest rates, not really affecting construction the way it uh, has in, uh, in the past. Similarly, auto and light truck sales, uh, they're up, not down, because we underbuilt. Uh, you remember all of the supply chain interruptions to the production of automobiles, the absence of chips uh, that are so essential in the manufacturing process. And so uh, auto and light truck manufacturers are still trying to ramp up. Uh, yes, there is a, a labor action with three of the companies, uh, but interest rates are not really affecting auto and light truck sales. Now, to be sure, if interest rates were down near zero, these numbers would be higher, but they're not declining. And it's a decline that would give you a recession. Durable goods is the other place where interest rates uh, uh, have an impact. So these are long live goods, including business investment. And this is new orders for durable goods. Is it record levels? We're not seeing interest rates affect this. So we're in a different world, which maybe isn't surprising because we're in a post pandemic world and pandemics and other big events really change behavior and they change the underlying data. And we haven't seen a pandemic uh, recession and the aftermath thereof for a hundred years. Uh, another element that we haven't talked about yet is new factory construction. The US has gone to industrial policy with the CHIPS Act, the infrastructure, the Inflation uh, Reduction Act, subsidizing the green economy and uh, the technological economy. And, th and this should be kind of astonishing for you. This is new construction spending on manufacturing. This is the building of new factories. It's happening all over the country and at record levels like we haven't seen before. Uh, and just to drill down on that, turning to California, uh, the graph that you see here is payroll employment, durable goods manufacturing in California at record levels. It's kind of tapered off a little recently, and we want to kind of dig into that. But first, what's happening here in California? Uh, and I, I think this is, uh, you know, very illustrative. On the lower right, you have durable goods manufacturing change in productivity 2019 to 2022. And that's by state. Uh, you notice on the left hand side, uh, productivity in California has soared. And on the right hand side, productivity in North Carolina is actually negative. It doesn't mean that factory workers in North Carolina are coming in and they're on their phones on uh, Facebook or TikTok and not working. It means that on average, new factories in North Carolina are producing goods, but the productivity of those factories is less than the average for North Carolina. And in California, what is happening is uh, new factories are manufacturing highly sophisticated uh, goods, and those have high productivity. So we're getting that churn. Uh, and you can see that also now returning to California with a percentage change in manufacturing jobs. That little dip there that's over on the right in the top graph. Uh, so that is in furniture, wood products, something called miscellaneous. But we still have growth at the same period of time in computers and peripherals and transportation equipment in uh, semiconductors and navigational equipment. So sophisticated manufacturing is growing. And we can see that anecdotally uh, in these uh, five pictures, uh, you know, California supposedly uh, is a business unfriendly state where you wouldn't want to build a factory, but here are the factories that are being built today. Tesla that has factories in Nevada and Texas is building a very large energy storage factory in Lathrop. Bosch, uh, in Roseville is investing a few billion dollars in building semiconductors, Evercharge in Haywood, Hayward, sorry, uh, EV charging stations. And here in Los Angeles County, Northrop is building an aircraft. Uh, in Palmdale, it's a greater than $80 billion program. And the one on the right-hand side, I think, is really sort of telling. That's Scorpios. 
Scorpius is a Texas company that builds semiconductors, and the picture here is their factory outside of Austin. They're closing this factory as soon as their new factory in Temecula is open. So California is attracting manufacturing, and it's sophisticated technological manufacturing. Uh, that is really the new economy that is coming to California, but eventually to the entire United States. Uh, we've read about tech layoffs, uh, and uh, and it seems like it's 2001 all over again with the dot-com bust. This is real output for the entire U.S. of software and tech design in uh, $2012, so it's in constant dollars. And uh, what we have here are two lines. One is data processing, internet publishing, and other information services. And the other is uh, is computer design. And you can see they're both increasing. You don't see any layoffs there. And if we turn to uh, another tech sector, professional scientific and technical services, uh, and uh, this is uh, this says June, it actually goes through August. Uh, my apologies there. Uh, no matter how hard you squint, you can't find those tech layoffs. What's happening is the large tech companies uh, are mature companies. They expanded rapidly. They bought a lot of other companies or they invested in new product lines and now they're consolidating and they are multinational. So the layoffs that they've announced are spread all over the United States and indeed the world and smaller tech companies the up and coming tech companies that are working with the cutting edge technology, they're growing and they're hiring the people who are being laid off. And one of the things that um, is really important in this, particularly in California and particularly in San Francisco, is AI. Money is pouring into AI because no one wants to be left behind uh, when it comes to this absolutely transformative new technology. So tech is not imploding. Uh, and so for the US, uh, our summary is that employment and income remain strong. Interest rate rises cool the economy, but housing and auto impact is still relatively mild. Uh, and infrastructure and defense are adding demand to the economy. What we still haven't seen is past and possible future interest rate increases. And we think that increases in the future are only gonna be a few basis points, about maybe 25 basis points. Uh, how much they're going to cool the economy in 2024 remains an open question. We have slow growth in 2024 as a result of that, but we don't have a recession. Now, a recession is coming eventually because it always does, but we don't see that in our near future. So let's turn now in uh, the little time we have left to China's economic stress and the end of export-led growth. You know, the Chinese miracle was really generated by uh, export of manufacturing and China becoming this industrial powerhouse. But export-led growth has pretty much ended and China's in a position where it must make a transformation of the economy and that's quite difficult. Uh, so here's just some of the verbiage that we've heard uh, enduring rivals then became strategic competition, then de-risking uh, as a way to kind of lower the temperature of the rhetoric uh, uh, to engagement. Uh, first, let's look at Chinese GDP numbers. Now, the, China has official estimates, and there's some good reasons why those official estimates uh, are perhaps subject to question. And one of them is that the way in which construction is measured and entered into GDP is different from the way in which construction is measured in the United States, in Canada, in Europe, and so on. So their GDP numbers are a little different. To put them on a comparable basis, uh, we at the forecast have uh, a macro model for China, and it is calibrated on the way in which Western GDPs are computed. And that is going to be the red line that you see there. And what we have for today, with some assumptions of uh, what's happening with home price growth, and that's a little opaque, uh, but a reasonable assumption, which is a 20% drop, uh, or 20% drop 
if it were entirely market transactions. Uh, that gives China a 1.8% growth rate, a uh, historically low growth rate for, for China. If that 20% is too optimistic, uh, we get a recession. So China may well be in a recession right now, uh, even though the official numbers are not reflecting that. Uh, and as we look forward and see what financial markets are predicting, we're seeing that in financial markets, investors are souring on China investments. And part of the reason here, maybe most of the reason, is the way in which uh, the Chinese government is trying to pivot away from export-led growth, relying on state-owned enterprises and, uh, and, and coming into the economy and intervening in some uh, critical or key private sector enterprises. So what you see here is uh, for the US, S&P 500, uh, ex exchange rate funds, uh, exchange transfer funds, China's equity ETFs, negative uh, 14%, US real estate ETFs, plus 23%, China real estate minus 52%. So really going in a very different direction, even though you see in the US, the real estate ETFs have declined, nothing like what you see in China and over time, that is since 2019, taking out kind of the strange things that happened in the pandemic, uh, the US actually real estate has grown. Uh, one of the things that has happened as China has tried to avoid having any recessions in the past is overinvestment uh, and leverage, particularly when it comes to capital formation and real estate. And here you see gross fixed capital formation, which includes non-residential as a percentage of GDP. Uh, China is the dark red. The US pretty flat, but the US is a much more mature economy. Uh, Japan, you see a big increase in the 60s and 70s as a percentage of GDP. Uh, and then it declines. And if we just take the, what happened in Japan and kind of move it over to the right so that we have the lines sort of similar to, uh, to each other, uh, even though they're separated temporally, uh, we see that Japan and China look a lot alike. But Japan in 1970, it flattened out and Japan went into uh, what's called their lost decades, lost in terms of economic growth. We're seeing that in China too. So that's a, a real similarity that gives us pause about what's going to happen going forward in the Chinese economy. And again, we see it in, in real estate. So this is residential. The previous one included non-residential real estate. And uh, the US as a percentage of GDP, this is going all the way back to 1930, uh, pretty stable below 8%. China went up to over 10%. And of course, it is coming down now. And uh, is it really a bubble? It looks like it. Now, uh, when you think about why this happened, I think there are two reasons. And, and those reasons are important as we think about the future. The first uh, is that the building of homes and the replacement of older homes, particularly those that didn't have kitchens, uh, which was fairly prevalent back in 1970 to 1980, uh, was an important part of policy. The second, uh, well, before I leave the first, uh, that's pretty much over with. The second was that uh, China had uh, in mind that the rural areas of China would depopulate. And agriculture would become highly capital intensive as it is in the West, becomes more productive. This is important for China because China is uh, actually resource poor when it comes to arable land. Uh, and they were expecting about 65 million more people leaving the countryside than in fact did. So they thought they were building homes for those 65 million people, but they weren't. So now we have a decline in, uh, in home building and, uh, and we've seen builder after builder default on foreign debt. And this is something that's going to take some time to work through. 
but it's not going to happen as fast as it does in uh, fully market economies uh, simply because of state intervention. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So uh, let's turn to U.S. imports from China. And uh, what you see here is Mexico, China, Canada, and Japan, U.S. imports. China is again in red, and its decline has declined by enough that Mexico is now uh, the largest trading partner of the U.S. Part of that is onshoring, that uh, manufacturing has moved from Asia, including China, to Mexico, uh, and that's because of political risks and uh, and because of U.S. policy. And so we are seeing Mexico ascending and China uh, actually seeing some decrease in exports to the U.S., uh, at least as a uh, uh, at least as a percentage. And that is prim primarily outside of consumer goods. Uh, but on the other side, Chinese consumers continue to import. Uh, and so what you see here is 2019 is, uh, is the amount that's imported by country in yellow, 2022 the amount imported by country in blue. And China's imports uh, have been growing almost everywhere uh, not so in Taiwan, but from other countries, really have been growing, and it's been growing from the U.S. So what's going to happen to U.S. exports to China if China is in or about to go into a recession? Uh, to answer that question, we want to know how exposed the U.S. is. So this graph, which is going to be hard for you to see, but it lists uh, countries by their exposure to exports to China. The world average is 2.5% right in the middle, all the way down at the bottom, not quite all the way to the bottom, but close is the U.S. at 0.6%. So even though there will be a decline in exports to China as China struggles to reorganize its economy, it's going to have very little impact on the U.S. economy. For some firms, it's going to be important, but in the aggregate, very little impact. Uh, and then turning to investment, uh, the appeal of foreign direct investment uh, of China really is waning. So here's foreign direct investment net inflows as a percentage of GDP, and China is way down. Investors are concerned about the housing market. They're concerned about Chinese government policy. They're concerned about Chinese government intervention into the private sector. And so we're seeing net investment uh, declining, uh, that China is not the attractive investment location that it once was, although there are certainly opportunities uh, that exist in China, it being a huge market. And even though we're sort of going through some numbers that are fairly negative, uh, I think that one never wants to count China out in terms of future growth. Uh, so, as a, a summary, uh, for U.S.-China economic relations, there's significant headwinds in the Chinese economy. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of discussion about what to do about that. Uh, Export-led growth is not a solution. Europe is not importing much more from China. You saw the U.S. numbers. Uh, that's also the case. Southeast Asia is kind of a bright spot for China. There are more imports going to Southeast Asia as those are fast growing economies, but there's real risk there because of Chinese activity uh, in the uh, South China Sea and the reaction of Southeast Asia countries uh, to that. Uh, real estate stress uh, plus government intervention in the private sector is going to push away investment. Uh, and so, uh, and U.S. industrial and political policy moves some manufacturing to the U.S. and Mexico. All of these things mean that the decoupling that we've been talking about for some time uh, is happening. It's going to continue to happen. But when we kind of look at it by sector, what we find is consumer goods uh, are still being produced in China in, uh, in large part. So if you think about building supplies, about light bulbs, about drywall, uh, these are, are still predominantly Chinese manufactured. 
uh, as well as many consumer goods and toys, that's not going away. Uh, China has a very efficient system of, uh, of a very efficient system of manufacturing and very efficient supply chains and infrastructure that really can't be duplicated. So a lot of talk about moving things to Vietnam and moving things to Indonesia, but just the infrastructure, the ports can't handle anywhere near the kinds of volumes that you get out of China. So that's still going to be there, but the growth, not so much. And uh, the Chinese government in the management of their economy is going to have to find solutions other than exports uh, to get the economy growing and to uh, increase production, increase consumption, increase wealth. Uh, the other headwind that we haven't talked about, but it deserves a mention, is the Chinese labor force is shrinking. So has China entered a middle income trap where uh, all of this means that they kind of stagnate in the way that Japan did in the 70s and 80s? Uh, maybe. So this is something to keep our eyes uh, on. China has uh, a history of being able to pivot pretty quickly. Uh, and, uh, and so it's worthy of a uh, pretty close examination because things can change uh, pretty much on a dime. Uh, and so finally, while trade between China and the U.S. will remain significant and very large, and there will be very large deficits uh, with respect to the U.S., that is, the U.S. will be buying much more from China than China from the U.S., growth and investment opportunities are, are more limited than they were before. They exist, but they're going to take uh, a bit more effort to find. The low-hanging fruit is pretty much gone.